Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our International Physics Webinar. Today is our 267 International Physics Webinar, and we have with us here to Dr. Peter uh, Plafstrand, Associate Professor, Department of Physics and Astronomy, George Mason University, USA, and he's also currently working as the director, George Mason Ob Observatory, NASA Mission Concept Study. And he has already connected with us, so I'd like to welcome our speaker, sir. Uh, good morning to your part and good evening here. Thanks for joining with us. So dear students and viewers, I think you have already come to know the title of the students' exciting international physics seminar. I think you have already come to know the title. And the title is the How to Find Earth 2.0. And uh, uh, you can also join with us by using the link. And you can also ask questions to our speaker by commenting. So uh, dear professor, you can start your session. And thanks again. Hello, everyone. So um, uh, thank you for the invitation to join you uh, today. I'm uh, Dr. Peter Plavchin, I'm a professor at George Mason University, and I'm the director of their observatory. Uh, if you could follow me on Twitter, at Plavchin Peter, uh, you can also visit my research website at exo.gmu.edu. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you about finding Earth 2.0. How are we going to do it? What are we going to know? What do we know now? So uh, we also have a newsletter at our observatory, uh, and I encourage you to go ahead and sign up for that. We send out monthly announcements about events uh, and fun uh, night sky facts, and you can sign up for that at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. So in the 2040s, NASA has recently been advised by the National Academy's Decadal Survey uh, in the United States to that its top uh, recommendation for a flagship astrophysics mission to launch, uh, which is a large optical infrared ultraviolet telescope yet to be named and let me go ahead and uh, skip forward in this video a little bit. Go here. And this mission is going to launch. This is just an animation of a concept that was developed a number of years ago. The telescope's going to hopefully fly uh, into a distant orbit, maybe like JWST, which has recently launched. And it will deploy one of the largest space telescopes that's ever been built. We're going to see it about to uh, be exposed here in a little bit when the fairing separates. I'll fast forward a little bit here. There it is. Whoops, went too fast. Uh, and this is at last, uh, or HABEX or LUVOR, depending on what you call it. And the idea is that this mission is going to try to take pictures of other Earth-sized planets around stars, nearby stars like our sun. Now, it's not going to look exactly like this. This is a concept of a possible mission architecture. But similar to JWST, someday we hope a mission like this will launch in the 2040s. And it's going to start looking at nearby stars and blot out the light from those stars to take pictures, potentially with a star shade or a chronograph, to take pictures of other worlds that look like this without the white lines drawn. But this is a simulated image of our solar system as if we were viewing it from about 10 parsecs or 33 light years away and, um, and blocking out the light from that star, from our own sun if we were seeing it from far away and see the faint glow of the planets in orbit around the stars shown here, Earth and Venus and Jupiter. But we have a lot of questions to answer to date. How many stars do we need to look at to find um, a, another pale blue dot orbiting another distant star? You know, how big and expensive does this telescope need to be? Will we know where and when to look? That's, that's the punchline of this talk. Is, and this is something I hope to see before I retire. But how are we going to do that? Let's rewind a little bit and talk about planets around other stars, exoplanets in general. 
Today, we live in a golden age of exoplanet discovery with over 4,000, nearly 5,000 planets now confirmed or validated to orbit other nearby stars. Many of them are very hot, like in this animation of the planet 55 Cancri E uh, with molten lava on its surface and the sun blasting so much radiation on it, we think that uh, some of this rocky material is going to blade it away by the star. If we take all the known exoplanets that have been found to date, and this plot is less than a week old, um, and plot them on a horizontal axis as a function of their orbital period around the star, and on their vertical axis as either their measured mass or their estimated mass, uh, this is what we have today. We have a lot of planets that are up in uh, this regime here about this mass of Jupiter with orbital periods. There's a cluster of them at orbital periods between one and 10 days. And then there's another cluster with planets with orbital periods around a thousand days, similar to our own Jupiter, which orbits once every um, decade in our sun. And then we have another population of planets down here that's been discovered by the Doppler and transit methods primarily. Uh, and these are populations of super Earths and mini Neptunes, all with orbital periods typically less than 100 days most of them with periods of 10 days. And then we have a few scattering planets out at very large orbital periods for which we've actually directly imaged those planets. And so could we find another Earth 2.0 today? The answer is no. If I were to put the Earth on this chart with an orbital period of 365 days and a mass about 1 300th, the mass of Jupiter, it would lie right about where I put that little um, black icon, black and white icon of our Earth. And if you'll notice, there aren't a lot of planets that we found to date that have similar orbital periods or masses to that of the Earth. And a great question you might ask is why? Does this mean that Earth-like worlds are rare? in our universe? The answer is no. Uh, the reason we haven't found many planets like Earth so far to date is that it's hard. And so today I'm going to tell you about the methods in which we find planets and what our prospects are using some of these main methods to find these planets. Specifically, you're going to talk about direct imaging, the radial velocity method, and the transit method. So let's go ahead and move on and talk about direct imaging. Perhaps the easiest me method of planet discovery to think about. When we zoom in on the light from a star, uh, shown here in this animation of the Beta Pictoris um, star near our sun, this star is very bright. It blocks, I mean, there's a, it's way, way brighter than the planet. How much we'll talk about in a little bit. But if we're able to block out the light from the star in the case of Beta Pictoris, in the 1980s, we discovered it had a disk of material around it. And then recently, within the past, uh, I think, uh, yeah, within the past 20 years, we were able to look even closer into the star, blocking out the light from the star. We saw a light, a dim light of another world about the mass of Jupiter and about the same distance from Jupiter as in our own solar system. And it, it, this was in 2003. And then a couple of years later, it disappeared. So we didn't think it was anything. We didn't know if it was a real planet or not. But a few years later, it appeared on the other side. Um, and this is you know, one of the early discoveries of direct imaging of exoplanets, but it takes blocking out the light from the star. This, to date, is the best movie we've made of the Beta Pictoris B planet. Just a, a pale dot um, uh, passing behind uh, uh, the star. Uh, this was about a decade ago that uh, we made this movie, and I'll play that one more time for you. Now, this is a planet that's easy to see because it's I young. Don't understand. Oh, so we my watch is talking to me. Apologies. This is a planet that's easy to see because um, it's young, so it's still hot from its formation, and <clears throat> it's also very big. It's uh, the size of Jupiter. Uh, and so it, uh, it 
is very bright relative to its star. And it's one of the reasons that we've been able to detect it. If we go and um, look at another planetary system, which is the HR8799 planetary system, which in 2009, we started and discovered that it has four Jovian planets. And we've actually made a movie. This is real data taken over several years. Uh, and it's there's some interpolation done to animate the movie between times in which it was observed. We didn't observe it continuously. But we've actually been able to see the four Jovian planets in this solar system over the course of several years. Oh, oops. Uh, go around the star. So kind of like the clockwork of the planets going around the sun in our own solar system, we're actually now able to see, directly see the light from other worlds going around their sun over time. So this is about, um, let's go back here, about seven years worth of, of data. <clears throat> and you can see that the planets making their uh, arcs um, of their orbit around the star and the light from that star is blocked out. So um, a good question is, why is this hard? Uh, right now, we can only see young Jovian mass planets around other stars. What, what is so hard about finding another Earth uh, with um, this technique? So in order to understand that, I want to talk a little bit about, and I'm sorry, my mouse is being very jumpy today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we find a, um, and how we image other planets. So let's imagine we have a star. I was going to use my pen to do this on the iPad, but unfortunately I couldn't get the technology to work out in time. And let's imagine we have some planet, <coughs> some distance, D, away from the uh, the star. And let's imagine this planet has some radius r. Well, we know the star puts out some amount of light, let's call it some flux f, and that light spreads out into a sphere around the star with a radius d. And then that planet <coughs> intercepts only a small portion of that light from the star and either and in the case of reflected light uh, will reflect a portion of that light not a hundred percent of it back to the back to the observer whether that be us here on the earth or or otherwise <coughs> so we could do some math and and calculate why this is hard what is the fraction of the amount of light that a planet intercepts coming from its star that heats it up, though so it could radiate thermal radiation in the case of a young planet, or in the in, in the case of infrared wavelengths, or reflect it to us in the case of optical and near infrared wavelengths. And to first order, it's some uh, reflectivity number, or um, uh, that's some constant between zero and one. So the fraction of the light from the planet divided by the fractional light from the star. And I'm drawing with my mouse here, so apologize for my handwriting. And it's going to equal the amount of area of light that the planet intercepts, which is just the area of a circle, the first order, divided by how spread out the light from a... Um, from the star is, and that'll be equal to four pi d squared, where d is a distance from the star to the planet. So these two things cancel, the pi's cancel, and this is a number between zero and one. So we could just say it's, it's 0 0.5, let's say half the light gets reflected. Uh, and so we have some um, number here. So this is about 0 0.5 times uh, r over d squared. So R is the radius of the planet, and D is the distance from the star to the planet. So we can plug in some numbers. Uh, and let's take the Earth, for example, in our own solar system, one AU, one astronomical unit. And the radius of the Earth is, um, off the top of my head, a number that I'm struggling a little bit with. I think it's around 7,000 kilometers. Uh, so we have over here, and I'm going to move up here to finish this uh, math. So we have something like 0 0.5 times the quantity 7,000 
over the distance between the Earth and the Sun in kilometers squared, and the distance between the Earth and the Sun is 1.5 times 10 to the 6 kilometers, roughly speaking. And that's 7 times 10 to the 3. So this is equal to 0 0.5. Just simplifying the math here. We've got 7 over 1.5. I mean, that's around 4. <laughs> A little bit bigger than 4, but we'll just call it 4.3 <coughs> times 10 to the minus 3. Um, let's make sure I did that right. That should be a route. Uh, I think I've got a math mistake here. So let me just double check for real quick. Do, 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 do. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's about right. Something's not adding up. Give me one. Oh, ha! 10 to the 8th. My mistake. 150 million kilometers. So this is 10 to the minus 5. Apologies, it's not 10 to the minus 3. <clears throat> and then we have to square this. So I'm going to go over here in the bottom. So we have 4 squared, which is about 4.3 squared, which is about 20, times 0.5, which is about 10. This ballpark averaging here, astronomers like calculating things to the nearest power of 10. And we have 10 to the minus 5 squared, which is 10 to the minus 10. So we have 10 times 10 to the minus 10, which is about 10 to the minus 9. Uh, and this is about the right number. This means that the for every billion, and the actual number is closer to 10 to the minus 10, uh, but I was doing some very rough math here. Uh, but for every one photon we get from an Earth-sized world around a sun-like star, we get 1 to 10 billion photons from the star. So that's the challenge of finding Earth 2.0 with a direct imaging method. We have to sift through the needle in the prefer proverbial haystack and find that one photon out of 1 to 10 billion that comes from the planet and doesn't come from the star. So this requires big telescopes to collect enough photons. And it also requires big um, instruments that can block out the light from the star. So how do we block out the light from the star? Well, there's the next challenge, the instrumentation and the hardware. And there's one technique, which is a star shade, which I'm not going to talk about. But uh, in simple optics approximations, uh, can we image Earth's interior using neutrinos? Well, um, so briefly to answer that question, uh, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we'll come back to it later. But if we have light from a telescope coming in, uh, it, there you would think you just put a little disk in the way to block the light from the star to see the light from around it. That's not enough. But it does do some of the work. And the first person that invented the idea of, of blocking the light from the star was Leo. And so he invented the Leo coronagraph. You put an additional stop in what we call the pupil plane of the telescope at a second stage here, and you block out most of the light from the star um, uh, bef uh, after it gets through this instrument. Then the light that comes from the planet, which is next to the star, comes in at a slightly different angle. It misses the, the Leo stop, as it's called. Uh, and this is a nearly century old instrumentation idea, and it was first used for the sun, of course. And then it goes through differently through the um, the, the pupil plane stop of the Leo coronagraph. And then you make an image and you see most of the starlight is gone. And then there's the planet next to it. So this is kind of a cartoon picture of how the instrument is built to, to block the light out from the star. But in practice, the data is very messy. This is an example of a ground-based telescope image using a chronograph where as much of the light from the star, from HR 8799, has been blocked out, uh, but there's still a lot of it left, this, this messy noise that we call speckles. And so there's a lot of software involved and tricks that astronomers employ to subtract that noise and, and see the planets that are much fainter 
than the stars. And from the ground today, we can find planets that for every one million photons we get from the star, we get one from the planet. And so those are primarily Jovian planets that are young. And so we are finding today a lot of young Jovian planets around nearby stars. But we've got a long way to go to find Earth-like worlds. And we hope to do that at some point by the 2040s. The second method by which we've tried to find Earth-sized worlds, and it, it, we have, and it's been very successful, is a transit method. By, by far, the vast majority of planets around other stars have been found with a transit method. And a transit method is, is fairly simple. Uh, the idea is that the uh, planet passes in front of the star with respect to our line of sight, blocking some amount of the light from the star. And we detect this planet as a, as a change in brightness uh, in, uh, of the star. It's an indirect method. And this technique was first successfully used in 1999, shown here in the upper right, with the discovery of the Jovian-sized planet HD 209458b, which blocks more of the starlight than the Earth-sized planet would because Jupiter is bigger than the Earth. Well, in uh, 2009, NASA launched a Kepler mission to scan over 150,000 stars, and they discovered over 5,000 candidates of transient planets, some as small as Mercury. Um, and four years ago, NASA launched the test mission to find more of these worlds. They realized that, well, Earth-sized planets are small. Maybe if we focus on stars smaller than our sun, the so-called M-dwarf opportunity, it would make it easier to find Earth-sized worlds. Indeed, it has been uh, since the test mission launched four years ago. And the test mission has gone, uh, sorry, the video uh, jumped around. Uh, and the test mission stares at parts of the sky for periods of 27 days, imaging uh, the whole patches of the sky. Each one of these squares that you see can fit over 400 full moons. And over the course of a year, it observed half of the sky for 27 days at, of, at a time with some overlap at the ecliptic poles. And this it started with the southern hemisphere of the sky. And then after the first year, the test mission flipped over and repeated those observations in the northern side of the sky. Uh, and we're now in the at the end of the fourth year of the NASA test mission. It has repeated both parts of the sky a second time to help confirm many of the can or validate anyway many of the candidates that it has found as well as finding additional planetary systems and many of these worlds are earth-sized the problem is that they're all very hot they're not at the right temperature that it would be suitable uh, for liquid water on the surface of those plants if those plants had liquid water but there is a famous example that was not found by Kepler or TESS, but it has since been observed by both Kepler and TESS. Uh, called the, it was found with a ground-based telescope called the TRAPPIST-1 mission, uh, TRAPPIST-1, the uh, TRAPPIST survey, and they found the TRAPPIST-1 system. They looked at a star much smaller than our sun, about a tenth the size of our sun, making it much easier to find Earth-sized worlds and we kind of got lucky. We found a system of seven Earth-sized worlds orbiting this dim red dwarf star. And because that star is cooler and dimmer, the planets were very close to the star. But because the star is so cold, three of the planets, planets D, E, and F, are what we consider could, or uh, E, F, and G, could potentially be in that star's habitable zone. And if they have atmospheres and if they have water, that water could be in liquid form on parts of the surfaces of those planets. So we have found some Earth 2.0s using the transit method. They're just not orbiting a star like our sun. There are more candidates that have been discovered by the uh, NASA test mission within the past couple of years. And many scientists around the world are working to confirm and validate those planetary systems. So how does the transit method work? As I mentioned earlier, we watch the brightness of the star. 
as the planet passes in front and a certain amount of light is blocked. Um, and so why can't we find a whole bunch of Earths like this? Uh, well, here's a little bit of the math. We could talk about the time of transit, how long it lasts. Uh, and as the planet goes in front, it has an in ingress and, a, and then an egress at the end of the tran transit. And so there's this property called delta depth uh, that measures how much of the light is blocked from the star. So I'm going to give you a little bit of math now. And delta is equal to the radius of the planet squared divided by the radius of the star squared to first order. Ignoring some other effects like the, um, uh, the what we call limb darkening on the surface of the star. And so for a Jupiter-sized planet and a sun-like star, Jupiter is about one-tenth the diameter of the Earth. And so it blocks about 1% of the light from the star. An Earth-sized world, by comparison, is about 10 times smaller than Jupiter. So one one-hundredth the diameter or radius of a sun-like star. So it blocks 0.01% of the light from a sun-like star for an Earth-sized world. This is hard. We can do it, and the Kepler mission has done it, and we have detected Earth-sized worlds, primarily at short orbital periods, orbiting sun-like stars, and we've also, as I mentioned, with the TRAPPIST-1 system, when you make the star smaller by a factor of 10, this number then becomes 100 times bigger, about 1% for an M dwarf. M star. I'm trying to write with my mouse. My handwriting is terrible. And this is for a G-type star like our sun. So we have to be very sensitive to detecting small changes in the brightness of the star as a function of time, 0.01%. We can do that with the Kepler and test missions. That's really exciting. But why haven't we found Earth 2.0 around a sun-like star? Well, it has to do with the transit probability. For, um, in order to get the right inclination for that star, to, for that planet to pass in front of the star, you have to have a random inclination so that it just lines up correctly. And as it turns out, the probability that a planet passes in front of the star is equal to, uh, I'm going to remember my math here, um, let's call it R star, the radius of the star over A, where A is the distance, well, it's the D I used earlier, it's the distance, average distance between the star and the planet. And so if you plug in this number for the Earth, we take one solar radius, and the distance between the Earth and Sun and solar radii is around 400. If I remember correctly, might be a, I think that might be wrong about that. That might be diameter. I might be off by factor of two. But the probability is small. There's, there's less than one in 100 chance that an Earth-sized planet would pass in front of a sun-like star where that Earth-sized planet is the very far away from the star compared to most of the transiting planets that we found. If you remember back to the early part of my talk, the transiting planets that we have found orbiting sun-like stars are primarily at short orbital periods because as we go out to longer orbital periods, the probability of having the right inclination for that planet to pass in front of the star. Even though we could detect it if it was there, the probability of it happening is just so low, roughly one in a thousand. So that's the problem. If we do some math here, we plot it for our own solar system planets, the probability that the Earth transits is around 0.5% as viewed from some other star looking at our Earth. So you have to be at the right inclination. So that's why we haven't found a lot of Earth-like worlds that are, that are Earth 2.0s around sun-like stars, but we have found some around cool M dwarf stars. And those are exciting, and we're going to look at them and characterize their atmospheres in the next decade, which I'll briefly touch upon at the end of my talk. So what about another method 
to find Earth 2.0, the Doppler method. The Doppler method uh, is uh, a, a little bit complex. It's an indirect method, and it relies on the Doppler effect. It's sometimes called the radial velocity method. And it has to do with Newton's third law of motion. For every equal action, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Planets don't orbit stars. Planets orbit the center of mass of the solar system. And the star wobbles in response to the planet going around it. And this causes the star to move towards us and away from us. And this means that as the star is moving towards us and away from us, the light from that star gets ever so slightly blue shifted and red shifted as shown in the spectrum of the star here at the bottom. <clears throat> now there's these barcodes in the spectrum of the star. These are called, we call them absorption lines. They blue shift and then red shift over time. And where do these absorption lines come from? Quantum mechanics, light um, at very specific wavelengths are absorbed by electrons in atoms of the atmosphere of the star. And those don't change. They're fundamentally due to quantum mechanics. And they're quantized. They only happen at very specific colors of light. This is kind of what we use spectroscopy to determine the composition of stars and many other things. <coughs> so we can take this method. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, as shown here is another example. If we look top down, at a, and this is exaggerated, uh, but this is a credit to Alyssa Albertas on Twitter, Astro Alyssa. <coughs> And seen on edge on, this is exaggerated, but the star wobbles in response to the planet going around it. And so if we plot the speed of the star coming towards or away from us as a function of time, it makes a sine wave as the light gets blue shifted and red shifted periodically. By measuring how much the velocity of the star changes, we get the mass of the planet. And I'll give you the equations for that in a minute. And by looking how long it takes for the, the velocity of the star to go back and forth, that tells us the orbital period of the planet. Now, this is quite complex in practice because there can be many planets and more that complicate the analysis of this kind of data. But let me go through what's called the seesaw approximation to give you an idea of the scale of what's involved. If I imagine a seesaw with a star on one end and a planet on the other, and I put a fulcrum under the seesaw to balance the star and the planet, the location, and we'll call this R star, and we'll call this RP for now the distance between the fulcrum and the planet. Uh, we have an equation that the mass of the star, in order for this to be balanced, the mass of the star times R star, the distance between the center of mass or the fulcrum of that planet star system has to equal the mass of planet times R sub P. So we have that the mass of the star is very big compared to the mass of the planet. So R sub P has to be very big compared to R sub star um, in order for these, this equality, this balance to be maintained. Similarly, when a, a planet goes around a star, uh, or goes around this fulcrum, as it were, looking from the top down now, so this is R sub P, we know that that planet travels around at some velocity V. And then, of course, we have the same thing going on for the star. It's got some R star. And it's going around at some velocity of the star. And so we know that the star for a circular orbit traces out a circumference of two pi r star, where this is the circumference of the wobble orbit. And it traces out that orbit with an orbital period p and that's equal to the velocity of the star. <coughs> and so this tells us how fast the star is moving. 
And we can basically plug this equation Here's what I found. into here, <coughs> solving for R star. We can make use of Kepler's third law, and we can solve for the mass of the planet. More specifically, orbits aren't purely circular. There are um, eccentric orbits as well. So this is a little bit complicated, but I wanted to show you that once you have the velocity of the star, thanks to uh, relativity um, and the Doppler effect, the velocity of the star divided by the speed of light is equal to the redshift or blue shift of the starlight, delta, the change in wavelength of the starlight divided by the wavelength of the starlight. And that's, that's how we relate the, the shift in wavelength of the spectrum of the star to the speed of the star. For more complicated eccentric orbits, if you write down from Kepler's equations the position, the radial position of the, of the star as a function of time, and then you take the derivative with respect to time to get the velocity of the star for fully eccentric orbits where the eccentricity of the orbit is epsilon here in this equation, you can write down the velocity as a function of time. For a circular orbit, E is equal to zero. So these two terms go away and you simply have two pi times AS, which is the same thing as R stars I wrote on the earlier slide, times an unknown inclination. So we could be orbiting it. We, we don't know how we're viewing it. We're just looking at the component of the light coming toward, directly towards us or directly away from us. That's the sine I term. And then we have the orbital period here. And then we just have the equation for a sine wave here. Uh, in this case, a cosine function with some phase and um, and it goes through the phase as a function of time. In this third equation, we can simplify it a little bit by writing this value k, which uh, combines some of these terms like the, the, the star's wobble size, the inclination, the eccentricity, and the orbital period. Apologies, my mouse is on the fritz. Uh, and um, we can write down this equation in terms of k and some velo some bulk velocity of the star with respect to the observer, in this case, our own uh, solar system. And so that's how we get an, a, a graph, a plot of the velocity of the star as a function of time that looks like this measured in meters per second. So that's a, basically a plot of this equation here. We can then... Uh, <clears throat> use some tricks of math and solve uh, using Kepler's third law for the mass of the planet. And we, we get a, an equation that's not perfectly solvable here, <coughs> uh, but you can simplify it in the case of a planet when the planet is much smaller than the mass of the star. And for a circular orbit, this, this, e, this e squared goes to zero. <coughs> You can write this down in terms of units that we're familiar with. And you can write down that the mass of a planet in Jovian ma ma uh, masses orbiting uh, a star is equal to 0 0.035 times the velocity of the star that we measure in meters per second. So in this example, it would be like 9 meters per second. Uh, and then we plug in the orbital period in years to the one-third power and the masses star and solar masses for the two thirds power. So if we have a nine meter per second signal at a one year orbital period orbiting in a one solar mass star, these two terms go to one. Um, this is nine. We can round up to 10 just to make this math a little bit easier. Uh, and we have for, for a 10 meter per second signal, this planet would be weigh 0.3 times the mass of Jupiter. Whoa, wait a second. So in other words, a planet almost the size of Jupiter, the mass of Saturn, it causes its star to wobble if it were at the same distance from the sun as our Earth. It causes the star to wobble by about plus or minus 10 meters per second. Uh, that's you know basically kind of slow car speeds, vehicle speeds. So something 300,000 times the mass of the Earth 
is only wobbling at the speed of a car. Well, what about Earth-sized planet? If you plug this in for an Earth-sized planet and, and work through the math, uh, and this is inverting the equation, it's, it's solving for the velocity. And so you can plug in an Earth-sized planet, which is 1 300th the mass of a Jovian mass planet. The number is about 10 centimeters per second. So you would have to take this number here and divide the scale and divide it by 100. In other words, for the Doppler method, for an Earth, the velocity of a sun wobbling in response, the semi-amplitude as we call it, is 10 centimeters per second, which is turtle speeds. So if you have a turtle crawling along, uh, that's about how much a star wobbles in response to an Earth-like planet. And believe it or not, we're trying to detect that in the next 10 years. Here was one of the first exoplanet discoveries in 1995 with an Earth-sized world. Uh, no, sorry, Jupiter-sized world. This one was about half the mass of Jupiter. It produced, but it orbited its star every four days. Uh, so the other hard part is making these measurements. And today, we design incredibly complex spectrographs. <clears throat> this one is the Espresso spectrograph at the VLT telescopes in Chile. It's inside of a thermally controlled room, inside a thermally controlled chamber, inside a vacuum chamber that is controlled to temperatures of changes of less than one one thousandth of a Kelvin, combining from up to four telescopes. And it has the instrument sensitivity to detect stars changing velocities at turtle speeds, which is wild. So in other words, it can detect stars and tell whether or not they're crawling towards us or away from us at the speed of a turtle, something 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. But there's a problem. It's not just a quiet ball. It has stuff going on on its surface, spots, flares, plages, active, active regions. And so if we make a plot of the velocities of planets, of stars, in response to the planets as a function of time in which we discovered them, we've gotten more and more sensitive, pushing down to meter per second velocities. Uh, and so in the early 2000s, astronomers were very excited that we would find Earth-like worlds before the year 2020. But something happened around the year 2010. We started running into problems with the Doppler technique. We stopped being able to re reliably detect planets with velocity, with causing their stars to wobble with velocities less than one meter per second. We thought we found a few, like Alpha Centauri B's planet, but that planet turned out not to be real. If you look at the number of discoveries of radio velocity exoplanets, as a function of time, in of 2012, the numbers were exploding, and we thought maybe we'd be well on our way to finding Earth 2.0 10 years ago. Instead, we had the great radial velocity market crash of 2013. We stopped being able to find more and more planets with the Doppler method. The answer was because of stellar activity. These active regions on the surfaces of stars rotate into and out of view giving us um, false apparent motion of the star as the star spins. So astronomers today are working really hard on trying to tell the difference between a star wobbling back and forth and active regions on the surface of the star rotating into and out of view. In fact, in 2014, at the time, we thought we had an Earth 2.0 orbiting the M dwarf star Gliese 581, uh, as, which is an M dwarf star. Again, this kind of M dwarf opportunity, this, the, the, the star is smaller, so this wobble is bigger. But it turns out it wasn't a planet. It was spots on the surface of the star rotating into and out of view. And so we're stuck and have been stuck with the Doppler method for the past five to 10 years, and astronomers are working feverishly to work on the mathematics and the technology and the, 
and the data analysis techniques to tell the difference between active regions on the surface of the star and bulk motion of the star back and forth. And I'm optimistic that we're going to get there um, in the next 10 to 15 years. We're getting close. We have some new methods that have had some small breakthroughs. So I want to conclude my talk telling you about some projects that I'm involved in working towards, with the Doppler method, working towards trying to find Earth 2.0. And one of the ways I've been doing that is using an instrument in Hawaii called, uh, um, using a telescope on, on Mauna Kea, Hawaii, uh, called IRTF, the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility. And it's shown in red uh, here. Here's the instrument. This telescope, to give you a sense of scale, it's a little bit hard to tell, but you can see a, a staircase in the background there. Uh, but this is about the size of a refrigerator. Um, and the telescope mirror in orange up above here, above the instruments, is about 10 feet across, or sorry, three meters across. This instrument was first installed in 2016, and we've been spending a lot of time helping confirm candidates from the NASA test mission. And we now have the sensitivity with our data analysis techniques to detect habitable planets orbiting M dwarf stars. We're still working on the stellar activity. That's another problem altogether. Uh, but it's interesting to know um, that at these wavelengths in the near infrared, we can um, get around some of the problems caused by the stellar activity, but not all of them. Uh, and this led to me discovering uh, in 2020 a planetary system orbiting an M dwarf star called AU MIC. And AU MIC is a famous star to astronomers because it is surrounded by a disk of debris. Just like Beta Pictoris at the beginning of my ta talk, astronomers have been imaging this star because it's only about 33 light years away, just under 10 parsecs. And it has debris far away from the star orbiting around it. This means it's a very young star. It's in the process of forming planets. So when the NASA test mission launched in its very first 27 days of science observations, it happened to look at AUMIC and it found a transiting planet. In fact, two that we've now found. And so this is a plot of the star brightness as a function of time. And the units here are not so important, but it blocks a, a, about a, a, a two, to three, plus two. two to three parts per thousand uh, of the light from the star every 8.463 days. So this is a very hot planet. It's not a habitable planet. Uh, and we also confirmed it with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Now, this is a really cleaned up version of the data. We had two transits that we found in, two, in 2017. The raw data looks more like this. Because the star is so young, it has spots on the surface of its star, making things even harder than an older star. But it, we find that it's a good analog for the challenge of finding Earth 2.0. And so we see the spots on the surface of the star rotating into and out of view, causing the brightness of the star to change over time. And then we catch these short transits, which last a few hours. And then here's the Spitzer data itself, which, which had some of its own challenges, but this was at a wavelength of 4.5 microns, so a little bit easier to confirm. And then we measure those planets with radial velocities. And this is work from a graduate student, former graduate student who's now a postdoctoral scholar at Caltech, um, Dr. Bryson Kale. Um, and with multiple instruments, including iShell and telescopes on Keck, uh, we are able to measure a mass of planet B and get a partial mass of the, a second planet in the system. And so one interesting thing is because these planets transit, we have both a mass and a radius. And this allows us to get a density of the planet. And these planets, because they're young, we expected them to be really fluffy, still contracting from the heat of their formation. Surprisingly, they're not. They're of a similar density to Neptune in our own solar system. And we're really puzzled by that. So there have now been an, another system where this has been found, but we are on our way towards finding smaller and less, um, uh, less massive planets, more like the earth. I'm also um, a, uh, a co-principal investigator 
of the Minerva Telescope Array in Arizona. And this uses the Doppler technique to look at nearby stars. And it's been oper in operation for a number of years. And we have another facility in Australia called Minerva Australis now, uh, which I'm also co pi and I'm trying to get the video to play. So give me one second. Uh, it's just it's a really nice little majestic video uh, showing the uh, showing this telescope array. We take the light from multiple telescopes and put them into fibers and send them to a spectrograph in the building to measure the velocities of the stars. And we're not quite at the precision we need to detect other Earths um, with these telescope arrays, but this is a project we're working on, uh, and we hope to continue funding development of going to the future. Uh, we also use a telescope on our George Mason University campus here in Fairfax, Virginia in the United States. We've helped confirm and validate multiple test candidates from the test mission. <coughs> uh, I encourage you to visit if you're ever in the United States. Um, and so looking towards the future, we just launched a month ago the James Webb Space Telescope into orbit. For some of these M-dwarf exoplanets, this telescope is going to be able to watch their transits. If they're some of them that are terrestrial, a lot of them will be Neptune size too. But we're going to measure their atmospheres for the first time and see what their atmospheres are composed of. And maybe if we get lucky, we'll detect a biosignature if it's in the habitable zone. At the moment, there's only a handful of good candidates for us to look at discovered by the NASA test mission. But the, the JWST has successfully launched and deployed. Very good about what it will do over the next 10 to 20 years. In 2027, we expect W first, now known as the Roman telescope, to launch. And it's going to use the direct imaging technique, as well as another technique I didn't have time to talk about today, the micro lensing technique, to image other nearby stars. And it won't be able to find Earth 2.0 but it's going to be able to image cold Jovian planets around sun-like stars, which is kind of a stepping stone for us technologically to imaging Earth 2.0, which as I showed you at the beginning of my talk, will launch a mission in the 2040s to take pictures like this. So this is an image that I hope to see as an astronomer when I retire, the image of a pale blue dot orbiting a star other than our son. And I'd like to thank you for having me today, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. So we have got a few questions. So if we allow, we can start our discussion session. The first question, uh, can we image Earth's interior using neutrino? So I, I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no, um, just because the neutrinos interact so weakly with the Earth's interior. However, um, we can image the Earth's interior using seismic waves. So the array of earthquake sensors we have in geology do allow us to determine um, via the changes in the speed of propagation of seismic waves through the Earth's interior and seismic stations around the world. So thank you. We have another question. So if the universe is expanding, then how can we measure the distance of the planet with a billion light years away by telescope? Yeah, so as it turns out, um, we may have had the first exoplanet discovery in a galaxy besides our own. But all the planets that I've talked about today and all the planets that have been discovered with the exception of that one have been in our own galaxy. And so our own galaxy is gravitationally bound. And we're not talking about billions of light years here, right? So in the case of the nearest galaxy, Andromeda, that's only a few million light years away. Um, but uh, in the case of these other nearby stars, we're talking only 30 light years away. So the expansion of the universe is not a factor here um, in that search. Thank you. So this may be the last question. So how black hole is observed by telescope if no light escapes from it? Yeah, so that's a great question. So uh, there's been a lot of news recently about imaging black holes coming out from the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a radio um, telescope array the size of the planet Earth 
um, using telescopes and, and a technique called interferometry. And you're right, we don't see the black hole itself. There was also a recent discovery just in the news this week of the first micro lensing discovery of a black hole, of an isolated stellar mass black hole. We think that every galaxy in our universe has a supermassive black hole at its core. And we know for stars more than eight, sorry, more than 25 times the mass of our sun, when they die and go supernova, we believe that they form stellar mass black holes of at least three times the mass of our sun. So yes, black holes don't emit light, but what happens is material that is in falling to the black hole does emit light. And so what we usually detect is not the black hole itself, but the light of the from the material around the black hole. Thank you, sir, uh, for your wonderful presentation and discussion session. So I think uh, this is a very good, good opportunity uh, for students and the viewers to uh, learn a lot of things about the research on the, the searching on Earth 2.0. And I think uh, some of our students may be motivated by your lecture and uh, will join this research very soon. So uh, thanks again uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity. And hopefully yeah. in near future, we can arrange another webinar with you. And after the situation become uh, good, uh, we can invite you for a festival session. You know, yeah, that'd be great. Let me just and add, I uh, conclude, we do have a PhD program at George Mason University. Okay. Great. And we do take applications. So if you're a college student watching this, mm -hmm. please apply to our program uh, okay. for next I'll... year. We're, and, uh, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, sir. Okay, have a nice take day. care. I'll inform all of my students and the peers about it. Thank okay. you, sir. Have a nice day, sir. Bye-bye.